So you should get that little pop-up that's like, hey, we're recording, just FYI. And let me see, we got a pretty good turnout today. All right. Well, it is 4 p.m. I'm going to vamp for maybe a minute or two while we let folks in. Um, just a reminder, if you have not already registered for the upcoming professional development days in June, um, I know we've sent a few emails about them. Please register. It's going to be super crazy fun. Um, we're just going to party the whole time because it's the first time we will have been in person in a really long time. So I know the schedule says that we have all kinds of important like work stuff to do but we're probably not, we're probably just gonna party the whole time, right, Jared? Yeah, yeah, love it. <laughs> no, we do have some really excellent sessions, um, but we are gonna do a little bit of partying. Um, so for those of you who maybe haven't heard me talk for a little while, because um, I don't think Megan and I have really contributed a whole lot to uh, these sessions. I'm Molly Kearney. I'm the Executive Director for Art Possible Ohio. Um, my colleague Megan Fights is also right there. She just waved. Um, she is not going to talk as much today because she's got a little, little sore throat happening. Um, I will be leading the bulk of this professional development session. And we are going to talk about universal design for learning today, otherwise known as UDL. Um, and if you've got your camera on, just give me a quick like hands in the air if UDL is something that you've heard of, even if you don't have a ton of experience with it, it's like it's on your radar. You've uh, been around it. Okay, cool. Um, what we'll do today is I'm going to buzz through a presentation, um, sort of giving you the sort of the quick points on how to utilize it and why it matters. Um, from there, we have a couple folks on the call who I know have some pretty extensive experience using UDL. So I'm gonna ask them to chime in a little bit and talk about some of their experiences working with the framework and how it applies directly to their classroom experience. Um, and then we're gonna workshop one or two of the actual little UDL standards. And we're gonna talk about some experiences maybe you've had in the classroom where you've had to make adaptations. My goal at the end of this presentation is for you all to walk away from it and think, oh, that's like, that's actually probably pretty easy. And it's stuff I've been doing on the fly anyway. And this is just a great way for me to get a couple more ideas and a couple resources to help me do it maybe a little bit better when I get into a classroom situation where I do have students who have special needs or who require accommodations. So if that sounds good to everyone, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and for those of you who might not have a good sense of who we are, uh, Art Possible Ohio is the statewide service organization on the arts and disability. And our mission is to make arts experiences more inclusive and accessible for for everyone in Ohio um, while working with artists who have disabilities to make that happen. Um, and universal design for learning, spoiler alert, you're probably already doing it, is a great way to take the really solid work that you're already doing in the classroom, add tiny tweaks and adaptations to make sure that every student in your classroom um, has what the ADA requires, which is a, a reasonable accommodation to get them to the point where they can learn in the least restrictive environment. So it's a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. So all of the universal design for learning framework is based on many years of research. Um, it's updated pretty regularly. And it's similar to the Ohio academic content standards in that it is a framework with some benchmarks. Um, it is different in that it does not give you direct content to teach. Um, and actually the Ohio academic content standards refer regularly back to the UDL when um, there are questions in there about how do I adapt this to other learners or who, to learners who might need some accommodations we'll refer back to the UDL. Um, 
The UDL is designed by CAS, which is a nonprofit educational research and development organization founded in 1984. So it is not a government agency. It doesn't come from a state yeah. agency like the standards. Parked on the street, so. Um, it sounds like someone is unmuted. Um, and it's updated regularly to reflect and respond to changes in technology, the science of learning, and our understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the most recent update came in about 2019, 2020, um, but it is updated every so many years as new research comes out, as new um, information comes along, especially when we think about a field like um, autism and the autism spectrum, we are constantly getting new information and new research on how students on the spectrum learn and how they process information. And so as that new research comes to light, the UDL is adapted so that it can be the most responsive to um, how each student takes in information. And this is just a quote from their website. Um, that they have from the National Education Technology Plan from the U.S. Department of Ed. Um, it has come to dominate the field because of its broad applicability and its research foundation in the learning sciences, both cognitive and neurosciences. So we're not just looking at sort of the soft science of how we learn, but also the hard science of how our brains are wired when we're thinking about the UDL. And why is it important? This is one of those things where I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir. Um, as teaching artists, we are constantly adapting and changing and looking at our individual students and sort of throwing the traditional curriculum and lesson plan off to the side so that we basically have this set of guidelines and then we're approaching each student as an individual artist and creator and trying to get to the level that they are at so that we can meet them where we are, where they are. And this is a great, quote from the website, learning is impossible if information is imperceptible to the learner and difficult when information is presented in formats that require extraordinary effort or assistance. And so we can think about this in the sense of like, if in order to get to the content, I actually have to learn how to learn that content, then for each of those steps, I'm one more removed from the content that I need to understand. So I gave the example of Algebra 2 because when I think about the classes that were most difficult for me when I was a young person, um, when it came to math, I had the most barriers to learning. And so the way math was taught in our school was everything was in the textbook. We were handed a textbook. We were told to read the chapter and digest the information and then fill out the problems in the textbook. Then we would do board work, which meant we had to get up in front of the class and like fill out our equations on the board. And then there was the whole language of math. So there's three barriers right there. I'm not someone who learns well from a textbook. And if I'm not given another way to access that information, it's a struggle. I have to read it a few times and I have to take notes on what I read. And so it takes me a lot longer to get through that content. Um, when it comes to board work, I can't imagine anything more mortifying than taking a student who is already struggling with the content, putting them up in front of their peers and saying, okay, now perform this content that you're already struggling with. So now you've got this social emotional barrier that the student has to grapple with like, oh, not only am I not quite getting it, but now I have to make it public to everyone and embarrass myself that I'm not getting it. So just kind of like piling on the shame there. And then in addition to that, there was a language barrier that um, the way our teacher explained math concepts was great if you understood the language of math, but if you had not learned the language of math and how to talk about the different um, terminology that he was using, then you also had that language barrier of not understanding, you know, when he says cosine and sine, okay, well, remind me again what that means. Which curve is that? Is that the this one? Is that the this one? I can't remember. So. Anytime you can remove those barriers or offer alternative ways around the barriers. So yes, we might have the barrier of the textbook, but maybe there's a detour that I can take where I can watch a video and someone explains it to me through a video. Maybe I might hit that barbed wire of the board work, but maybe there's an alternative detour where I don't have to get up in front of the classroom and present to everyone my lack of knowledge, I can fill it out on a sheet of paper and turn it in that way. So I was wondering, given this example, um, 
Is there anyone in the group who would like to share a similar example of either their experience learning or a child's experience learning where they were hitting up against these barriers that in order to even get to the content and understand it, there's this barrier of how do I learn how to learn the content? So if anyone has an example, um, you can go ahead and just unmute and start talking. I think it's important to share because it helps us understand and determine like, oh, I needed a detour here. What kind of detour might my students need? I'll, I'll go ahead and go because um, I relate to you 100%. And um, whenever I present myself as a teaching artist, I always tell people that I teach like I wish I would have been taught as a child. And um, I, I just the, the, the one teacher that changed my life, her name was Miss Johnson, and it was pre-algebra, and I had to go to summer school at East High School. And she just changed my life because I just like, I don't do math. So there you go, Miss Johnson. And she was like, you're going to do math in my class and you can do it. And, you know, and she she gave me that encouragement. But I even take it a step further because I really do believe that I, I teach how I wish I would have been taught. That's so great. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is um, be the person you needed when you were younger. And that's something I try to live by, especially in teaching philosophy. Does anyone else have an example of a, of sort of this realization that, oh, the reason I'm not getting it is because not because I'm stupid or not because I'm lacking, but because there are these barriers. I, I don't, my example isn't from my personal, personal experience, but I did just watch this weekend. I happened to watch Ken Burns documentary on the address which is basically, it's the Gettysburg Address for very linguistically learning disabled kids in a specialized school. And um, I think it, it addresses this very issue from many different perspectives, showing how for any one person getting over these barriers is possible if you use all these tools in the arsenal. So just mm -hmm. putting that out there, if y'all haven't seen that. And what are some of the, you mentioned the tools, um, what are some of the, tools that they highlighted in the documentary? Well, specifically the the constituency, so to speak, is um, anywhere from dyslexia to dysgraphia to very challenged kids. And um, so they, they just do any number of, whether it's doing physical exercise to calm down the ADHD kid before attacking the task, or whether it's breaking down a sentence into its different parts of speech on pieces of paper that then the student has to put in the right order. They really throw everything at it and give them a long timeline as well to get to the end goal. They tell the kids, you know, you might you might present this this year, you might present it next year, but I don't need to, it's all well said in the documentary. So I'm not gonna, you know, if that interests you, I highly recommend looking for it. The libraries have it, Ohio library streaming service has it that's how I watched it this weekend and um but yeah it definitely addresses that awesome thank you Pamela and Carrie anyone anyone else want to share uh, I have something okay um Amy yeah it's it wasn't me but my daughter and I think it was fourth grade she had to do a timed math test for multiplication and division problems and she's really smart, but she just clams up when she's got the clock on her. And the, the school would not let her do any other way. Mm. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of cases, we don't realize as parents um, that we do have the option of things like an individualized education plan or um, stacked services so that if you do have a student that you think might need these extra accommodations and you want it to be a part of their everyday experience sort of without debate or without question, um, it is always appropriate to sort of have that conversation like, hey, I noticed that your student might need extra enrichment or might need extra support in this area. Let's have a conversation about what an individualized education plan might look like. Now, I use the example of math 
because now I'm going to, because how many of you identify with that? Like a lot of, I'm imagining a lot of people in the room are like, Ooh, math is not, I, I can like just get by. I can make change on a good day. So I'm going to flip it on its head a little bit and want you guys to think about the fact that there are students out there who at the end of their barriers, so they've got their little picture of themselves, barrier, 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 and at the end of it might be visual art or dance or music or any or theater or movement or any of the things that to us come really um, I'm not going to say naturally, but we're more comfortable with it. It's more how our brains work. And so whenever we're thinking about what we take into the classroom, as far as music instruction or visual arts instruction or dance instruction, um, we have to understand that there are also barriers to learning to what we do that we feel is very comfortable and that people like, why don't you understand? It's, it's the arts. Um, because I bet my algebra two teacher would have said, well, why doesn't she understand it? It's just math. Um, and so I'm wondering now, has anyone had that, that experience where they've gone into a classroom and it's been very challenging for them to work with one particular student? And I can actually start because I used to teach summer art workshops at the Columbus Museum of Art. And in every workshop we would get, we would have at least one or two kids who's, who would be pretty upfront with us and say like, yeah, I didn't, I don't really care about this camp. My parents signed me up for it because I think I need to know more about art. And so like, here I am. Um, and we were in a really fortunate position in that our philosophy is um, arts instruction is not about making specific things. Arts instruction is about the act of learning creatively and thinking critically and working as an artist works, which is inter across disciplines and across concepts and um, learning how to be divergent in our thinking and learning how to grapple with ambiguity. And so we were able to frame things in such a way where if we had a kid come in and they'd be like, yeah, this camp's all about outer space, but I don't really care. And we would be like, well, what are you into? And they'd be like, I'm into Pokemon. And we'd be like, great, let's find a way to make art, creative thinking, critical thinking about Pokemon. And then once we were able to sort of adapt what we were doing to the thing that they loved, then the spark goes off. So does anyone have any examples from their teaching experience where they encountered a kid who had these same barriers, be it the barbed wire or the like, what is that? I guess it's a road sign, keeping them out of the mindset of art making. I taught a program uh, last summer and I had a student, I teach songwriting and I usually try to use the musical influences of the students that I'm working with. And I had one student that I just could not get involved. So I asked him in a private conversation, what kind of music does he listen to? And he said, I don't listen to music. And I asked um, what his interest was in even joining this program. Um, and he said, well, I thought songwriting, I thought it would be an easy one. So he didn't really seem to have the general or the genuine interest in music. Um, so the way that we got around it was we were able to turn up a song that he really liked the words to. And instead of moving forward, learning how to write chord progressions, we did it backwards. We rewrote the words to his favorite song. And from that, he was able to create and understand how you uh, tell a lyrical story and how you do it to a melody. And we sort of worked in reverse at that point. And he was able to create a song by the end of the program. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. Any other examples? I have one uh, where when I was going into prisons, um, <clears throat> the guys weren't allowed to, um, they, they had to meet and meet a qualification to come do an art class. And so one of the guys couldn't read and didn't want to draw and didn't like art at all, but he had a story. So we had him tell his story. And then we had the other guys in the group begin to kind of write it out and he got involved that way. Then he felt safe from that point on to try to draw later. But it was like um, we recorded his story, let him record it into a mic and, or a, a cassette recorder 
but these were these were teenagers that were like between you know 12 and i mean um 15 to 21 or something like that and it was a guy who actually um wasn't wasn't comfortable reading or writing but and he didn't want to draw neither so when um we had him talk about his stuff <clears throat> we we were able to get some illustrations some 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 visuals to go along with some words and he had a story that was really cool and we had some people that I'm just telling you that that's how we had to do it with him. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Um, and the thing I love, thanks to Art, the thing that I love about these examples is that the things they have in common. So patience, meeting students where they are. So instead of saying, this is how I learn, this is how you have to learn. Instead, it's what's the thing that you get excited about? And then let's work backwards, like Diana said, even working backwards from that. And then I also love that it's bringing in some other support. So I'm not comfortable reading and writing, but I've got colleagues around me who are comfortable with that. So let's see how we can lean on one each other, one another and use each other's strengths in order to help each other out. So one thing that I do think the arts is really great about is it lends itself to this kind of thing. When we think about art making, it is about creative problem solving. It is about collaboration. Those types of thought processes are inherent in what we do. So universal design for learning really kind of draws on that. And I love it because a lot of the language that the framework uses is the similar kind of framework to what we use when we talk about the arts and the kind of work that we do in the arts. So the framework is broken down into three sections and they talk about the why of learning, the what of learning and the how of learning, which I think is a really nice way to sort of progress through it. So the why of learning, why should we engage? Why as a student who comes to your art class and is like, I could care less, my parents just signed me up for this, or I thought songwriting would be an easy A, so here I am. Little did I know that it's not. Um, or, you know, I have to take this arts class because it's part of my requirement for being in this detention program. Um, why should I be engaged? And this is a lot of what we talked about. Recruiting interest, sustaining persistence and effort, self-regulation. So why should I care? How are you going to hook me in? Why should I continue to care? Like when it gets tough, when it gets frustrating, when I get overwhelmed, what's gonna keep me from throwing in the towel and being like, forget it, I don't wanna do this anymore. And then self-regulation. When I'm having those strong feelings, how do I keep them from overpowering my learning experience? The what of learning. And this is the actual nitty gritty of pedagogy. What are we gonna do in the classroom that, allows us to convey information. So multiple means of representation. And I like that language because when we think about multiple means of representation, it speaks directly to the diversity that we see in our classrooms. Students from different backgrounds, students with different learning styles, students from different socioeconomic levels. So how am I perceiving information? What language and symbols are we using? So thinking about text rich environments and thinking about text and language in a very open-ended way. So it's not necessarily just English words read from left to right, but are we using symbols? Are we using imagery? Are we using sounds? Are we using textures? How many of our senses can be involved? And then comprehension. So, you know, we always say that learning doesn't happen as it's happening, it happens when we reflect on what has happened. So learning is not the experience, it's reflecting upon the experience. And that is how we actually build knowledge. So it's not just that I've absorbed the information, but once it's all in here in my brain soup, how do I put it all together and comprehend it? And then the how of learning. Um, how am I able to convey to you that I have learned that information? Is my only option getting up and writing on the board in front of all of my peers, including the guy that I have a crush on who I don't wanna know that I'm bad at math? Um, so can I do it in physical action? Can I do it through multiple means of expression and communication? And then what executive functions am I engaging in as I'm doing that learning? And if you have any questions at any point, please just holler at me.
So here's how it breaks down in a way that should look very familiar in sort of information flow if you're someone who has spent some quality time with the academic content standards, as I'm sure we all have. They are near and dear to our hearts. So providing multiple means of representation. So this is, if we go back to the last slide, then it's this center box, the what of learning. We're gonna break down one of these. So learners differ in ways that they perceive and comprehend information that is presented to them. Whoops, got a little frisky there. Learning and transfer of learning occurs when multiple representations hmm, are used because they allow students to make connections within as well as between concepts. So when we think about the way we learn, we like to build, um paths between nodes of information so if i've got this like little piece of information about the gettysburg address for example like we talked about earlier i can draw a little line from that gettysburg address line of information to maybe a movie that i saw about the civil war and so that now i have one line of information and if i've got that movie about the civil war and i've got the gettysburg address and oh, I've heard the name Ken Burns before. So now I've got another line down here that's like, oh, he does documentaries and stuff on PBS. So now I've got a triangle of information. And then maybe I've got another note of information like, oh, I really like other PBS shows. And the more we do those lines of information, all of a sudden we've built a basket. And so the more connections we can make, the stronger our basket is and the more stuff and knowledge we can put in it. And so when we're providing all of these different ways to access the information, we're making all of those synapses between our brain cells more powerful and stronger. So, and we can actually see that, like one of the articles they talk about in the Universal Design for Learning is this type of learning actually increases the number of connections in our brains, which I don't know about you guys, but I just think that stuff's really cool. So to reduce barriers to learning, how do we do this? It's important to ensure that key information is equally perceptible to all learners by providing the same information through different modalities, by providing information in a format that will allow adjustability by the user. So you're probably thinking, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, if I have someone in my class who's blind, I can't present all the information on the smart board because they're not gonna be able to see it. I'm gonna have to give them other ways to access that information. So then drill down even deeper, offer ways of customizing the display of information. So we wanna do it flexibly. We wanna do it with different perceptual features such as the size of text, images, graphs, contrast between background text and image, color used for emphasis, volume or rate of speech and sound, speed or timing of video animation and sound, layout of visual or other elements, font used for print materials. Um, and I'm actually, so Megan and I talk about this a lot in our presentations, we try to model this. So whenever we go through a slide, we read everything on the slide because someone might be able to get all that information reading and listening to me, but there are some of you in the room who are like, no, I'd rather just have you read it to me and then I can absorb it audibly. And that's a little bit easier for me to process. So given this specific example of providing multiple means of representation, is there anyone who has done this in the classroom in the last two weeks? Who's got an example? Oh, I saw a thumbs up. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. Sarah, do you wanna yeah. tell me how you did it in the last two weeks? Certainly, well, it's always important to vary or offer various ways of learning, both audibly and visually. For example, those are two big ones. And I'm a dance artist. And so, you know, putting movements into words in order to learn the sequencing of choreography has been helpful uh, for me and other people I work with, or even the literally writing out choreography or lesson planning that action of tangibly writing it and visually seeing it helps you remember too. Brilliant. And in those students classes, same thing when I'm offering a visual and then I have written information and I repeat it audibly too. Brilliant. Who else has an example? Just to drive home my uh, point. Yes, Eric. Um, within the last two weeks, I'm doing a residency with um, people in assisted living facility. And I'm working with recyclable materials. And one of the uh, things that I introduced to the uh, students is 
uh, they have a, a empty water bottle and I provide them with a uh, illustrated instruction sheet that shows the water bottle and how the bottle is cut into different pieces to make different projects. And along the side of the instruction sheet is a verbally describing each project and the materials and tools they're using to construct the projects that are on the instruction sheet. And I think they find that, you know, sometimes it's really important to connect the visual with the verbal, because I'm a visual artist. So I, if I can see it, I can pretty much understand it, or at least <laughs> that's the way I see it for myself. But, you know, not all people learn that way, but I try to combine the visual and the verbal information in a way that they can read about it and understand it, or they can see it, or they can put the two together. And Brilliant. for me, that seems to be uh, a tool that um, enables the broadest um, number of students to understand and to move forward to make the project happen. Wonderful. So this is just to sort of underscore, like, you're already doing this stuff on a fairly regular basis. Um, and it's a testament to like why to you're on the Ohio Teaching Artist roster, because we've seen evidence of it in your lesson plans that you're adaptable and you're approaching students from where they are. And that is probably the key thing. It's not the kind of thing where there's a magic bullet. It's um, sort of an ongoing process. Um, and I'm actually gonna call out one of your colleagues, Alicia, right now. Let me see if I can find her. There she is. Um, Alicia is one of our teaching artists for our adaptation, integration, and in the arts program. So Art Possible Ohio has a group of teaching artists that work specifically with students who have special needs. Um, many of them are in schools that are attached to departments of developmental disability. So they are students who um, in a lot of cases have profound disabilities and they are in schools that otherwise would not have arts programming because their focus is primarily on life skills and sort of the basic understandings that um, students will need when they go out into the community to get a job and to live their lives. Um, and it's a lot of support services. It's a lot of occupational therapy. And so we sort of fill in a gap where we send in teaching artists and they do arts programming with those students. We also have some teachers that are stationed or positioned at regular um, K to 12 schools. And then we have some that are at community schools or at other educational programs. Um, and one of our teachers this year is Alicia with um, In Harmony. Alicia, where you want to introduce yourself? And then I asked Alicia to talk just a little bit about uh, how she has worked with UDL and how she has integrated these concepts into the work that she and her group of teachers do when they go out into the field and they start working with students who might have special needs or need special accommodations. So I'm going to kick it over to you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say I'm so impressed with all of the examples that have been given so far about how everybody's thinking about UDL and already incorporating it. Um, Y'all are awesome. We already knew that, but it's you all are just really great. Um, so like Molly was saying, um, I am a teaching artist in a variety of different um, places and spaces, and um, I'm also a board certified music therapist. So some of the stuff I, you know, it, it aligns. <clears throat> Um, a lot um, and am able to incorporate a lot of what we're talking about um, into some arts integration. And so I think one of the biggest things um, that we think about or that I think about, I'm gonna make an I statement, is just thinking through um, potential barriers of programming and proactively <clears throat> planning to address it when possible. Um, so thinking about different learning styles, so thinking about how people process information, whether it's, you know, in their, in the most optimal way, whether it's visually, orally, kinesthetically, um, or a multimodality, um, and always having <clears throat> as much as possible an option for each one of those. Um, and so <clears throat> in my programming, I use, um, a lot of visuals, but not just words. I use pictures a lot in programming. I have many, many, many 
Velcro um, icons and pictures that can be moved and adapted and felt and tangibly um, manipulated uh, for students so that, that the information, even just about what we're doing for the day, um, is presented in a way that's accessible for them. Um, thinking about what individuals hear, what individuals see, <clears throat> if there's any adaptations that need to be made there, what individuals can do tech, um, in a tactile way, and then how individuals feel. And so something that um, we think about is <clears throat> what people might need sensory-wise. Um, and so and because we are music-based, sometimes there are individuals that have sensitivity to certain volumes of sounds or certain pitches of sounds. So higher sounds might um, be bothersome. Loud sounds might be bothersome. And so we typically always bring with us noise-canceling headphones that are accessible to individuals should they need it. Um, individuals that might need some, some body movement, even in seated activities, thinking about how we can get them wiggle seats. They're like little, for those of you that don't know, the little cushions that are blown up um, and they kind of look like a pancake, but they have little bumps on them. So when you move your tushy, um, it kind of creates a sensory experience. Thinking about um, tactile things to do with our hands um, so that our brains can focus. Sometimes, um, for those of you that might doodle while you're listening, you might be doodling right now, um, that's a way for you to do something with your hands, for you to do something that, that centers your body and centers your brain in a way that makes it more likely for you to be able to absorb information. Just like what we were talking about. We want least restrictive environment. We want everybody to feel successful, different ways of doing things, different ways um, of thinking about things. Music uh, is very visual. If you look at a piece of music, there's a lot of information on one page. <clears throat> Not just lines, sim weird symbols that seem like they come from nowhere, notes, there's dynamic markings, there's tempo markings, there's articulation markings. That can be very overwhelming. And so a lot of what we do might be breaking that down, making color-coded music, making things that are more accessible, making fonts bigger, um, thinking about, like Molly was talking about earlier, um, thinking about how we present language, thinking about, is it is it fortissimo or very loud? You know, what does that look like? Um, how does that feel in our body? How does fortissimo feel in our body? How does piano, how does quiet feel in our body? Um, those types of things. So just just thinking about different ways of presenting information, trying to anticipate and plan for barriers where we can, um, having access to multiple um, things that people can access if they need it, and asking individuals what they need. What do you need right now? I'm noticing that this, that you're frustrated. I'm noticing that your brow is furrowed. I'm noticing that your fists are clenched. I'm noticing that you're needing to move your body. What do you need right now? Um, most, more often than not, most of the time you're going to get an answer. <laughs> um, and being able to meet students where they are and give them what they need is really just, is really the key. So Molly, did I, did I answer the question? You want to tell me to talk about anything else? No, that was awesome. Um, and I will say that I think one of the things that we run into as um, facilitators, as educators, as folks who are doing this work is sometimes we get overwhelmed and we are afraid to ask. And one of the things that Megan and I always like to emphasize is when it comes to doing work with accessibility and inclusivity, it is better to ask the hard question and engage in the what might be awkward conversation than it is to continue to operate in a place of not knowing and then potentially causing harm. So that I notice that you are, or what makes you say that, or tell me more about what's going on right now. Any way that you can sort of help students identify within themselves, these are the struggles I'm having, these are the barriers I think I'm perceiving, then you end up with students later on down the road who can say things like, you know, I'm a visual learner. And so while I appreciate that you've given me this giant textbook, 
I would really love it if you could help me find some resources that are video based or image based. Um, I know me personally, as a parent and an educator, if one of my students or my children came to me and said that, I'd be like, you are so good at learning and you are so good at knowing how you learn. And that is such a gift because that's going to serve you later on in life. Giving them that language is so, so important. We all have heard stories. We might have even been that kid who got to college and was like, oh my God, I have to do this by myself. And I don't even know how I learned best. So start them early and then give them that information early. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to bump over to um, the UDL website because it has, CAST has a sensational resource. Um, can everybody see my computer? Yep. Awesome. So the CAST organization does um, some other stuff in addition to UDL. They're a great clearinghouse for um, educational resource, especially when it comes to accessibility and adaptability. Um, and they're also great at case making. It's the kind of thing where if you need to say to maybe a teacher that you're working with, hey, I think we should integrate some UDL into this classroom. And they're like, mm, I don't know what that means or why I should do it, you can go to the CAST website and they're going to have a great article that you could just shoot to them or a couple bullet points that you can share that's going to help you make the case for that. Um, in addition to that, if you go to their Our Work, um, actually my little toolbar is like smack dab in the way there, um, and you go to their uh, Our Work section, you can see they've got all kinds of great links for research, design and development, accessible accessibility and inclusive technology, um, post-secondary education options for those of you who might work with adult students, um, workforce career education. And this stuff is great because if you're someone who is sort of new to the world of adaptability and accessibility, and you're like, I'm not even sure where to start. I'm not even sure what's out there. I'm not sure, like I'm trying to teach a painting class. I don't know, like, how do I adapt my materials so that my students can use them and access the information? This offers some really concrete options for how to do that. The other thing that it gives you is a lot of classes on how to use these items and apps on how to use them. But the thing I really wanna show you, the PS de resistance is the UDL guidelines themselves. And the thing I love about them, because I love a good chart, when information is put into a chart, it makes my brain feel really good, um, is they have this wonderful chart that you can look at. And each of these things is a link. So if you're wondering, okay, I have this group of students who like physicality, kinesthetic learning, that's what they do. They like to move well, provide options for physical action. And here are some examples of how I can drill down and find ways to make physical action work for everyone in my room. So providing alternatives for physically act interacting with materials by hand, voice, signal switch, joystick, keyboard, or adapted keyboard. If you've got someone who is completely not mobile and they do need an adaptive device, this is a way you can go about it. Um, requirements for rate, timing, speed, range of motor action, required to interact with instructional materials, physical manipulatives, so fidgets or things that kids can touch, um, things that have a texture and technologies, um, and then alternatives for physically responding, indicating selections. So maybe you've got a kid who is not willing, who's like real uncomfortable with raising their hands. They don't wanna be called out in class. So give them the option, like you can write your answer down and I'll walk by your desk or wherever you are and I'll check on your answer to see if you've got the information. Um, and I will say this is not to say that we don't want kids getting to the point where they can interact in ways that might be more in the norm with the rest of the class, but it should be in phases. It should be giving students a platform where they feel most comfortable because if they get to the point where like, hey, I'm comfortable doing this thing and now I've got the information, now raising my hand doesn't seem so scary. You've removed one of those barriers for them. You've snipped the barbed wire. So now they feel like they can walk through it. I hope that makes sense. 
Um, and then for some students, like if you are working with kids who do have sensory sensitivities or who are nonverbal, you, in those cases, you have to meet with them where they are because they're not going to be able to vocalize their answers. So you have to give them another way to go about it. So, wow. uh, yes. I'm sorry. I was going to say too that um, there, at one of my centers, there's a nonverbal lady that just kind of walks around and moves stuff. And um, I, it's just like, it seems like most, most of the staff just kind of ignores her and just like, is like, and you know, they're there to help in the process of whatever I'm doing. And I always speak to her and like talk to her like she's going to do this project. Like I, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, it does a disservice when you ignore people who are nonverbal or who don't like norm, you know, learn in the normal, typical way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, the thing I, that's so important to remember is just because someone, and this is something we used to tell our um, student teachers at the art museum all the time, just because a student is not engaging with the content in the way that every other student is engaging does not mean that they are not engaged. They are just perhaps expressing their engagement in a different way. They are engaging with the content, maybe at another level that is more interesting to them, but just because they're sitting back passively does not mean that they are not fully with it and fully having an experience. And so being aware of those passive signs of creative engagement are so important. Um, thank you for that. That's wonderful. And also just like, you know, it's kind of, if you felt a little shy or felt like you didn't want to engage, I'm sure you wouldn't want to be ignored. You want to be a part of the community that's learning. Um, it's rare that a student doesn't want to be a part of the learning community. It's often more the case that they aren't quite sure that they're invited into it. So I would like to pick one and Megan and I pre-picked one and then I got all excited and now I've forgotten which one I picked. So we're just gonna go ahead. So let's workshop this one a little bit. So for representation, offer alternatives for auditory information. So sound is a particularly effective way to convey the impact of information, which is why sound design is so important in movies, why the human voice is particularly effective for conveying emotion and significance. However, information conveyed solely through sound is not equally accessible to all learners, and is especially inaccessible for learners with hearing disabilities, for learners who need more time to process information, or for learners who have memory difficulties. So this is important because when we think about auditory, we immediately think, oh, someone who is deaf. But auditory information can be a lot to handle for someone who gets overwhelmed when there is a lot of sound. Um, I am someone who has some hearing loss. I can hear if one person is talking to me, but if there's ambient noise, I can't process anything. I can't process any sounds. And I kind of just like, I'm real bad about it. I just kind of check out. Um, in addition, listening itself is a complex strategic skill that must be learned. So how many of you know people that are really good at hearing, but they're real crummy at listening? I do. And you sit there and you're talking to them and you can tell, oh, you're just waiting for the sound to stop so that you can now start talking <laughs> and you're not listening to anything I'm saying. To ensure that all learners have access to learning, options should be available for any information, including emphasis presented orally. So what are some examples, in addition to the ones they've given, or more specific examples to the sort of categories that they've given of how we can make auditory information more accessible? Um, we had the great example from um, Eric, it was more about text versus image, but kind of in that same vein. And I especially want to hear um, from people whose art form is maybe music or sound based. Like how have you um, worked with other students who sound is maybe not their jam? Well, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm Jim McCutcheon and I do music and uh, science. And one of the things that I find really important is the tempo of your words, how quickly you speak and how much time you give the listeners time to process 
what you are saying. It's, it's critical and you have to be reading the, uh, the audience, you know, in, and, and seeing, uh, are they getting these ideas and, and delivering ideas at a, an appropriate tempo. And I love that because it's, it's seemingly simple. It's a very small adjustment you can make. Um, I am someone who tends to talk really fast. Um, <laughs> my dad used to joke that when my sister and I would talk to each other, he, it was at a frequency that he just couldn't hear as a human being because it was so fast and like, blah, blah, blah. So simply slowing down, taking a breath and allowing for pause in your speech. A lot of people are real scared of silence and it takes a lot of practice to sort of sit there quietly and let the information sink in or let the questions and comments come to you rather than pausing for a hot second, getting nervous and then being like, okay, I'm gonna fill the room with my, with my voice again. Um, but yeah, just a very simple change the tone, change the pace. Um, Terry, are you actually like raising yes. your hand? Yes, I just wanted to add one more thing to that. So I've worked with a lot of senior citizens. I'm in the midst of my residency now again, and I'm always reminded that the tendency, if someone, they have hearing aids, they say, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. What I do is resist the impulse to raise my voice, make my voice louder, but um, enunciate better. Mm -hmm. And what is lost, especially in English, are final consonants. And that's what senior citizens who really have hearing problems are missing. So not to get louder, but get more distinct mm -hmm. in your pronunciation. Definitely. Definitely. And it is also okay to pause and ask if my, like, has my information been received by you? I have just said a thing to you. Do you understand it? How would you put it into your own words? Um, especially with young students. Like here, I've explained this concept related to um, depth and perspective. How do you understand it? Don't just repeat back to me what I said to you, but translate it into your own words so that I know that I've, that you fully understood me. And if you haven't, let's figure out where that disconnect is because it's probably not just the way I explained it and probably not just the way that you heard it, but somewhere in between. And what can we add to help enhance that understanding and enhance that information? Awesome. So I'm gonna do one more and then we will open it up for some discussion and multiple tools for construction and composition. So a tendency in schooling to focus on traditional tools rather than contemporary ones. Um, I got called out recently because I asked my daughter if she could read the chalkboard and she's eight and she kind of did this. I'm like, mom, what are you talking about? We don't have a chalkboard. This tendency has several liabilities. It does not prepare learners for the future. It limits the range of content and teaching methods to be implemented. It restricts learners' abilities to express knowledge about content, in other words, assessment. Um, and it constricts the kinds of learners who can be successful. Current media tools provide a more flexible and accessible toolkit, which learners can, be more, can more successfully take part in in their learning and articulate what they know. Unless a lesson is focused on learning to use a specific tool, i.e. to draw with a compass, to learn how to do math on a calculator, to use a graphing calculator, curricula should show alternatives. So like any craftsman, learners learn to use the tools that are an optimal match between their abilities and the demands of the task. And this one I particularly like because when I took a drawing class um, in college, I was all stressed out because I was trying to draw a straight line for this drawing I was doing of a, like, of a building on campus. And um, my professor, Fioris West, who some of you might know, he um, passed away not too long ago, walked behind me and he was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I can't get this line straight. And he goes over to where his materials were and he pulls out a ruler and he hands it to me. And he was like, we have rulers for a reason. Stop struggling to draw a straight line when man has invented a ruler and you can just use a ruler. 
And I remember thinking to myself, God, Fiora's is smart. <laughs> and it was this great like revelation of we have all of this tool, all of these tools, you use the right tool for the job. So what are some examples of tools that have, I mean, I'm not going to say they're to the level of my discovery of rulers, but that have really transformed or helped you in teaching students that have been a challenge for you to teach? I'm sorry, I'll talk the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I Mine is a little different. Mine is more of, um, I when I'm um, teaching and I'm presenting something, I'll go, let it be what it wants to be. Like, you know, if, it, if your line needs to be a little cricket, that's fine. Like, that's what your line wants to be. And so I, like a lot of times I, I try to get people past, like, it's not turning out how I want it to be. And I'm like, let it be what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So sometimes the tool is a shift in the way that we think that we've been conditioned that it has to be a certain way. But if we were to shift our brain a little bit, be a little bit more flexible, express the knowledge and content in the way that is most true to what we're doing, then that becomes a great tool. It becomes a tool of our, of our mode of thinking. That's, that's really good. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Pamela. Um, that's, thank that's, you, Pamela. That's, 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 I feel like I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Echo. I don't know what that's about. Is it, is it, be, is it better? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Um, thank you, Pamela. I agree with that. Um, another tool that I use is breath. Um, I'm a movement dance teacher and dancer. Um, and I really focus on the power of your own breath as a tool to either calm yourself down or heat yourself up. And it's something that each person has. You don't you don't have to have anything outside of yourself. And I find especially with younger and older, older dancers, too, but especially with younger dancers, recognizing that you have the power to calm yourself down and slow your breathing, or you have the power to, to get yourself active and ready to go with, within yourself, that, that's very empowering. And it um, allows them to, like you said, Pamela, let the thing be what it's going to be. Like let their leg go as high as it goes or as low as it goes or however many turns they do because they know they're in somewhat of a control, you know, within themselves. Awesome. Thank you so much. Molly, we're at three minutes. Yep, I was just going to say, okay, now we're at two minutes. So how many of you at the be like, realize, oh, this, I'm already doing it. Like the tagline is there and I was, yeah, I'm already doing UDL. I might not have been able to put a title to it, but adaptation, flexibility, these are things that are happening in my classroom and in my learning spaces. I'm seeing a lot of nods. I'm seeing some hand raises. Yeah. Um, it is. I think it is a thing that comes pretty naturally to people who work in the arts because we are so used to, as Pamela said, trying to do the thing, it not working out the way we want it to, and then having to adjust and having to make a change. Um, to wrap up, does anyone have any questions either about the specific resource, the website that I showed about any of the examples, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can see your faces a little bit bigger. Um, there we go. Any questions at all? Or any final thoughts? Any final ideas? So I will say this is a resource that we do use. Um, if you want, I think Megan sent out the PDF that we use that's sort of an abbreviated version of this. Um, it's what we give to all of our teaching artists that we work with. We also have a longer version. Um, and the last thing I'll say to that PDF is we consider it to be a living document. 
which um, when a teacher goes into the classroom at the beginning of the year, they're not going to know all of the adaptations and accessibility accommodations that they're going to have to make on day one. It's a conversation and it's a living, breathing thing. You're going to get to know your students, what their um, needs are. And so it's the kind of thing that you work on as you go. And it really is about like building that toolkit to make sure that um, if you do encounter a student that has a sensory sensitivity, um, has low sight, you can say, oh, I've got some ideas. I know what we can do to work with you to help you figure this out. Um, I will say if you have any questions, if you like that you want to ask offline, Megan and I are really easy to get a hold of. I'm Molly at Art Possible Ohio. Megan is Megan at Art Possible Ohio. And we will talk about accessibility all day long, literally all day long and not get tired. So thank you guys so much for sharing and for um, giving us those great examples. Um, we are so thrilled to be working with teachers and teaching artists who just are so talented and are so willing to meet students where they are in the way that you all do. Any final words from my partner friends? Thank you, Molly for the great session and good good knowledge and good resources, appreciate it. Thanks. All right, guys, I get to release you. Go have dinner. <laughs> have a good evening, everybody. Take care. <laughs>